I'm Charlie Wright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Paloma Baeza, one of the directors of the Netflix animated piece, The House. Uh, first question I wanted to ask is, uh, why was it chosen to have a different director for each segment of the, uh, of the film? Well, um, I suppose it was because it was a sort of incredible brainchild of uh, Charlotte Bavasso at Nexus, thought that it would be really interesting to bring three different filmmakers together in, in case it's, it's four really, but it's a team, one um, Mark and Emma are a team. <clears throat> and um, I think Charlotte really saw that uh, she she knew about each of us and felt that there was some really interesting overlaps in terms of our tone. Um, and we all worked in stop motion, so animation. So, um, so, Charlotte got us together to brainstorm um, to see if there were some sort of parallels between the kind of themes that we liked. Um, and that's really where the, the whole project was born. So it really was from the beginning, a project which was um, designed to, to be a, an anthology uh, of three stories. And, and we needed to find something that, that would connect us um, and, and put together something sort of unique. Um, so yeah, so it was important to keep each of our identities in terms of the separateness of our filmmaking, but also try and bring together what unified the, the piece. And I was also curious as to, um, uh, did you have a, 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 a consulting with uh, the other directors of the other segments or did you all just concentrate on your own vignettes? We pretty much, we, well, once we were up and running and shooting, I mean, we, we were really separate. So we were concentrating on our own films, but we were also very aware of the others. So if things were changing with, um, say, the synopsis or then the script, then we all knew about it. Um, and, and there was a constant dialogue between us in terms of sort of, progress or questions and that was something that was very unique you just never get to do that as a filmmaker you are you, it's, it's in some ways quite lonely if you're the sole director and you, you know you're making the decisions and you have your team and it's very collaborative but ultimately the buck stops with you creatively in that sense um, and being able to see other people's process in that in that that closely in terms of directors um, that you're working alongside was was uh, was a complete privilege really so so we did keep in touch and yet we're working quite separately so it was sort of a, a, a bit of both I guess so um, I guess uh, the main character of this uh, film is as the title suggests the house uh, what went into the design of of the house and was that design kept the same for each segment? Well, it was it was a huge challenge because the house needed to be, you know, it is it is a character in itself, and it needed to be recognizable, sufficiently recognizable um, in each story, so that you recognized it if uh, as you watched each story. But aesthetically. Each filmmaker is quite different, and also scale-wise, the scales are completely different. Um, so the challenge was, together with our production designer Alex Walker, to come up with uh, some recognizable features of the house that then we could sort of bend and stretch depending on what the story needed. Each narrative needed something slightly different. And the key areas in which we all settled on together, we each had our separate um, uh, production process with Alex Walker but also then together we had some meetings together where we all talked about the kind of houses we liked or the architecture and that there are some distinctive features that were picked out so there's some very distinctive windows these round windows that you'll see and there's a cupola on the top of the house and the entrance and the staircase was really key so that I think you definitely feel even though they look very different in terms of the aesthetics, you know, Mark and Emma use wool and felt. Um, 
Uh, I have fur, Nikki's is quite modern, but though that entry hallway is absolutely the same house, even though they're different scales and slightly different sort of um, builds. So all that work that we did in terms of planning, there are all these very detailed plans and for the build um, really paid off in the end because creatively you, you can see that it's part of a unit, even though they're separate. Uh, and so on the other end of that from the house, what went into the design of the characters? And was that process uh, basically like streamlined for all three of the um, of these of the vignettes? Yeah, I mean, it was slightly, each of us needed slightly different things and worked in very different ways. So again, for example, Mark and, Mark and Emma, Emma always had made her puppets from scratch you know that's that was their process and so for them I know that handing that stuff over we had McKinnon and Saunders are just the sort of most incredible puppet makers in the world and we were lucky enough to have them as uh, as our collaborators so so they they contribute a huge amount also our, our sort of um character designers that we each had each designed in a slightly different way so i used a character designer felicity hamos who is really terrific so she would draw the cats um it in and um, we would have a back and forth i had a very um a very clear idea of of wanting them to be based on the sort of dimensions and shapes of feline the feline shapes but also then making them our own so so once you get those drawings in then then it's a case of you go to the three-dimensional stage of of sculpting them from plasticine which they did at McKinnon Saunders and that was the same for all of us but we all were demanding slightly different things and in my particular case that the emphasis for me was always on um performance so I come from a performance background and I always sort of like to get the most you can out of the expressions um and i'm very uh mindful of um movement um and the acting side of those puppets so a lot went into the head mechanics of those cats um uh in order that the eyebrows can move um, and the eyes can move in a particular way um the tails that kind of thing as you know, you're a cat, you're a cat owner. Um, the tails can be very expressive. So, so there were all these elements um, coming together with McKinnon and Saunders, who are world-class experts in furring as well. They did puppets for Fantastic Mr. Fox. And so they have all this expertise um, on how to put all those things together to make it just, actually they're just things of beauty, these, these puppets, really amazing creations. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought up uh, your uh, your background as a performer because uh, the thing that I found probably the most striking about your segment was that the characters were so what were by far of the three segments the most emotive. Yeah, yeah, it's I I, I really focus on. I mean, I focus on. You have to focus on everything, but it's it's. I think for me, I. I love a really good story, a really good, well-structured story, but I also feel it's very important that you feel something for, you know, you, you care um, about characters and, and that's the best combination of things is where a story clips along and then you, it makes you feel something, whether it's sad or happy or hopeful or whatever. But um, so, and, and, and in order to create that in animation, you have to really keep an eye on things. You know, you have to really, care put the time in and that that's um a process of the puppets as as i've mentioned but then you have the the process of the performance so you have the cut to cast it really well which i was very lucky to to be able to get the cast i did really terrific actors who bring so much into the recording booth and are able to ad lib and play around with things and then you can really use that and and play off that and the animators can can use those ad libs in the animation so then you're working with the animators and the animators then become the actors really because they are fulfilling that voice with the movement that we discuss and act out lots of acting out 
um, lots of videoing, lots, there's lots of embarrassing videos of me, of every animator sort of being um, as unselfconscious as possible in order to reach the right um, note of reality, which is a silly thing to say in some ways because it's so unreal, the world that we're creating. But if you pump as much reality into that, whether it's in the aesthetics or in the performance, then it creates something that's oddly believable, even though it's unreal, which that's my sweet spot. I love that feeling of you, you can get immersed in it, even though it's fantastic. So um, uh, again, also uh, uh, bringing up, you know, you, when you first started uh, in this industry, uh, you were working as an actress, uh, but now you're directing and directing a lot of animation at that and stop motion. And I'm curious, I, you know, it's not that, it's not uncommon for you know actors to pivot to directing, but it feels like it's a bit more a bit more specific to go to directing animation. How did you come to make that pivot in your career? It's a very strange one, and it's one of these journeys that I feel very so sort of grateful for. But I had been I had been direct while I was acting. I'd been directing some live action shorts, and then but I'd always made things, you know. So I suppose there's I've always made little characters and. Um, from felt or wool or what, whatever it was um, for fun or knitting. And, um, and I think I reached a point in my career where I was frustrated. And I then just, so I then discovered, I sort of started making my own little films, you know, um, I'd voice them and I'd make a very badly, you know, put together puppet with wire and I didn't know what I was doing I'd have a camera and it would be shaky and I, I that's how I sort of came into stop motion and I reached a point where I thought well I think if I don't explore this now I might never and so I did something that seemed really crazy at the time and I went back to film school uh, by that point I had two kids and it seemed you know I sort of had a career and I Sort of sidestepped at to see what would happen and this is the product of that I suppose but what I discovered was and it did seem like a huge risk but I think it's really life-affirming to know that one can do that and I see it time and time again as you go on you don't have to end up doing what you start doing in life you know there's all these avenues and you evolve and what I found is that all the stuff I did before I came into animation, because it was slightly out of my comfort zone, informs it massively. Um, you know, like all the stuff I've been doing about acting, I can sort of put it in there and it gives a different perspective. Even, even coming from live action into animation gives you a slightly different perspective on storytelling or, or scene structure and um, or the way of playing things. So um, I just feel really fortunate to have had these mad opportunities, yeah. So um, curious, uh, is there, um, uh, I'm get, have you always been a fan of stop motion? Is there uh, something that you saw, uh, you, know, uh, you know, years ago where you were like, where it always, where you saw something that was stop motion, you were like, it, it just like stayed in the back of your uh, mind of something to pursue? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think the quite, I, I used to love the, I used to love the old Ardman stuff. Um, I mean, going way back, you know, even if you go way back to the creature comfort stuff, because I think that inspired so many animators because it brought together a sort of realism <laughs> um, with the voices and, and, and the gesture. So that's always been a, an old inspiration of mine. And then I think also it's not, you know, I'm not, it, I'm not going to say anything really uh, surprising here, but but both Fantastic Mr. Fox and Paranorman, which is a Leica movie, um, both really inspired me for different reasons. I think, I think Fantastic Mr. Fox really inspired people because it, it, it had this tonal humor thing, which could straddle adult and child's worlds. Or it could, it could, you could sort of go places with it. You could take character driven stuff and be silly and absurd but also it but also be quite beautiful it's really beautiful um and paranorman i think is always a source of inspiration because of what it does well just in terms of the visual storytelling so what the camera does sometimes in some of the some of the segments in the scenes i often sort of cite this the moment that paranorman 
um, that you learn that what he's seeing and the camera revolves around him. And it, it's so beautifully put together um, where all the elements of filmmaking are coming in, it, they sort of unified the music and the and the character and the camera moves, um, and and they're, the, they're puppets, they're sets. It's the whole thing is sort of so inspiring. So I think I could see the potential. I mean, it's very difficult to make things that way, but um, I could see that this had a whole scope, which um, live action can give you but you can create your whole universe in a very different way in animation from nothing. And that's really exciting, yeah. So uh, also I wanted to ask, you know, we are at awards site and you had a very interesting experience a couple of years ago uh, when you won the BAFTA award for best British short animation for Pulls Apart uh, yeah. in 2018. What was the experience like of uh, winning that honor? Uh, I mean, it couldn't have been more amazing because, like I said, I'd gone back to film school, you know, uh, taken this massive gamble. And I, at so many times I was thinking, oh, this is crazy. What are you doing? <laughs> like, this is like, <laughs> you're going to go into animation. It's even harder than live action. Like, it's not even. <clears throat> and then my graduation film won this. And then I got nominated and that was like, that was great enough. But then to win it was just, it was phenomenal. Um, it means so much. I think awards like that, with that kind of story, that kind of history, where you've really fought, um, and there are lots of examples of it, where it, it means so much, and it means so much to the team who are all there. And, you know, I wanted them all to be on the stage, and they couldn't be. It was this great big Albert Hall, a huge venue, and but I knew they were all there, and so we just partied afterwards. We partied at like three a.m. It was like we were dan the DOP was dancing. Um, it was just straight up brilliant celebration. Like nothing tarnished it, you know. Proper golden moment. Yeah, yeah. That's when awards really come into their own. Can I just say, that's what it would be like if 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 the house got nominated. By the way. That's what it would feel like because we've we're so proud of it. We're all collectively so proud of what we've achieved. Um, yeah, it would it would have huge. You know, sometimes you think, oh, awards, yeah, well, yeah do they? They, it, they sometimes they really matter. They make a difference. Yeah. Well, uh, Paloma, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best over this Emmy season. And to all of our viewers, please like this video, smash that subscribe button, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your Emmy predictions. Thanks so much. Thank you.